Hey, uh, hey good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody online and here in the room. Um, thank you very much for participating in the uh, in the webinar about uh, large language modeling today. Um, this is uh, part, we are organizing this part of the uh, force collaboration across the industry collaboration here in Norway, and um, we are part of the data analytics, machine learning and data centric workflows group who has uh, set out an aim this year that we're going to have a couple of webinars around machine learning. We had some relatively easy introductions in the beginning, then went to time series, had a look a little bit how pictures are being processed and always in the context of oil and gas data. And today we're going to be talking about large language modeling uh, or language models in, in general. That has really taken the world uh, by storm in the last couple of years, really, or even months, we have to say, since ChatGPT, but language modeling has been around for a long time. People have tried to make sense out of text with rules and haven't really made great progress until about 2018, 2020, when popular libraries came around in, in Python. And then the big breakthrough, of course, that everybody is aware and will dramatically, dramatically change the way uh, we will process unstructured information in the future is things like ChatGPT. So I think it's very pertinent to get a good insight on what these tools do and how we can use them to our favor uh, in the future. And uh, I also wanted to make you aware, let me just go back to the other screen here. I also wanted to make you aware that we have organized here in Norway a, a language modeling hackathon and uh, still open for participation. The idea here is that we, that we will generate a very large data set of Norwegian, uh, British and Dutch oil and gas data, so of Circum North Sea. We have extracted that text and that text will be available to play with in the hackathon um, where people can test out ideas with large language models. There will also be access to high-end computing via Microsoft. And um, if that's really what you think you are interested in, if you're a programmer or not, doesn't really matter. You can be a normal geoscientist or a normal engineer if you would like to learn more about it. Think about it and sign up. Um, with that, I'm handing over to uh, Mahat and Lukas, two data scientists uh, from two different companies. Mahat works for Wintersal and Luka, Lukas works for Arca BP. And uh, Mahat's going to give an introduction to um, to uh, language modeling and large language modeling. And then uh, Lucas is going to show some examples from what I understand afterwards. So uh, please ask your questions in the chat along the way. Um, we will maybe answer them while the seminar is going on, maybe afterwards. Uh, please be aware that the talk is recorded and your questions will also be recorded. Thank you very much. Just quick, I've got IT here if you want to fix it or if you just want to run like this, we can go to a different room. No, I think we have to, because of time constraints, we unfortunately have to live with the fact that we don't have it on the screen here, but I um, have to share a computer here. <laughs> we can have a look at the screen here. I think you share the link so we can log in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but, um, but this is the problem that you don't share through the meeting. If you share through the meeting room, then it would show up here. Okay, and how can we fix this on the quick? I don't know why it doesn't recognize the HDMI. And Let's just continue. I think we find a solution around it. Uh, it's just, it just affects us. The majority of people is online. Will that work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you you know, first, do you see the screen? Do you have, no, no. You have the link for the PC? You, you can, can just you know, link. You have the PC. You can link it. In. Yeah, but I don't have the link. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take this side and this is open. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I guess I guess we start while we try to sort out our internal in-room IT issues. Uh, we will kickstart because my understanding is that online everything is working. Yeah, we see online is thumbs up. Um, yep. Hello and welcome from my side as well to everyone that is here in person. Thanks very much for coming and also to quite a few people that have joined virtually. Uh, I think Peter already gave a, quite a, a useful and encompassing introduction into what Today's session is going to be about, you see the title on your screen, it's titled Natural Language Processing and Large Language Modeling, Large Language Models as a whole. And I think the, the naming of this uh, session, personally for me, I did that quite on purpose because yes, while the focus in past years, past few months in particular, has quite significantly been on large language models, 
as Peter already mentioned, natural language processing as a discipline has actually existed for quite some decades already. And for myself personally, I'm sure I speak on the behalf of Lucas as well. The aim for today is to provide some of you um, some technical insights, keeping it rather a surface level, but technical nonetheless, so that moving forward, when all of us will inevitably be interacting with natural language processing or large language model modeling based systems that continue to um, facilitate the work that we do, as they already do, at least my work, and I'm sure for many others as well, you do have some technical understanding about what kind of systems you're dealing with. This, of course, provides a lot of benefits in terms of understanding of possibilities, but also, and equally importantly, understanding of the limitations of such systems as well. To that end, I brought myself here <laughs> and also Lucas. Um, just a quick introduction of my own self. Name's Mahad Nadim Janjua. For those of you that don't know me, especially outside of the Winter Saldea environment, I am working as a data scientist uh, in Mersaldea, specifically in Norway for the past eight months, but I've been with the company for about two years. Um, have been engaged in projects in the space of computer vision as well as natural language processing in the, in the recent times, but I also dabbled on and off in pure software development projects for our company as well. And maybe Lucas, a, a few words from your end. Yeah, uh, hi and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lucas Mosser. Uh, I work as a data scientist in RKBP. And over the past uh, sort of six to eight months, I've been working as part of the teams that are enabling the use of these large language models like ChatGPT uh, in RKBP itself. And I'm really happy to be here today to be able also to share some of the use cases uh, that we've implemented in-house and to contribute to this uh, excellent uh, seminar. So thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, um, so just a quick outline of the agenda for today. Would like to first start off by setting the scene a little bit. I think that for a lot of us, I can imagine we've heard, been hearing terms like natural language processing kind of buzzing around in our environment for a bit, but perhaps we don't fully understand the context of what it is about, what it has been about versus what it is about today. Um, and I would like to also formalize what natural language processing is as a multidisciplinary discipline, because I think it's important to have the same vocabulary about the topics when we're talking about the topics. And then this is the, the more slightly technical part of the presentation, um, the fundamental concepts in natural language processing, because these fundamental building blocks uh, really lie at the very foundation of even the more complicated models like ChatGPT or other models that are coming out increasingly as well. So having some fundamental understanding of the technicalities will also pay dividends for you and for all of us in the long run. Uh, that's, that's, that's the hope and that's the belief, and that's why we include that in today's presentation as well. Would like to then segue a bit more towards large language models, specifically ChatGPT, because we can really use ChatGPT as a prime example of how large language models actually typically are developed and what they are capable of and perhaps what they're not capable of. And then would like to finish off by presenting some value cases at Winter Saldea and Opera BP. Perhaps would, would be useful to just say, I would like to, from Winter Saldea's side, just briefly mention a project as an example of what we're doing, but then I would hand over more specifically uh, to Lucas here to talk more about the application side at Opera BP. Good. So we kickstart then formally by setting the scene a little bit. It's the third time I'm saying this. Natural language processing has been around for quite some decades. More specifically, I think the, the, origi the origination of natural language processing can be thought of all the way back to World War II or post-World War II when interest in machine translation really grew, right? The idea was to actually understand how natural language can be encoded in some sort of algorithmic way, binary, so to say, that computers can understand and also then can also decode for human beings to understand. There were key studies that came out that defined goals and methods, how this could be achieved. One is the Weaver's memorandum that really is considered the godfather document of machine translation and natural language processing. And such a such research actually then paved the way for the next couple of decades from the 1950s to 70s um, for research to then really start exploring the, the, the syntactic and grammar theory of language more specifically, specifically for computer algorithms. During these two or three decades or so, um, the idea was that uh, the researchers would explore how to hard code in principle, as we call it, right? Actually, them, them themselves figure out algorithms and codes and rules uh, that can actually justify the, 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 the principles that we have in language. But for all of us that speak language, which is all of us, we understand that language is not as easy of a concept to grasp and definitely is not as easy to directly encode per se. Um, 
This then opened the pathway to actually the 1980s and 90s when the statistical model revolution came, machine learning actually started coming in. And while during that time, the results were quite com comparable or comparable uh, to the, the results in these hard-coded, hand-coded um, systems uh, to represent language, it at least broke this, what you would call this complexity barrier, uh, such that the machine started actually making inferences from the data and started coming up with rules uh, to, to um, what would you say, embed language as opposed to human beings having to do that themselves, right? So this was a breakthrough moment. And then came in the time of neural networks, right? That actually have a lot more capacity in terms of uh, multidimensional uh, data set that they can actually work with. And these then really open the door for what we call language modeling, or so to say, next word prediction that we see as the fundamental basis of even the modern large language models that we see, right? So neural networks then really open the landscape for language to be interpreted and worked with as the complex thing that it is. For now, natural language processing exists all around us in technologies all around us. Some of it you might be very acute, acutely and obviously aware of, and other things perhaps some of you might not be aware of. So one example that I have listed here is an email spam filter, right? Um, a lot of the junk email that you actually don't even see dropping in your junk is actually filtered out by very, very clever natural language processing based um, uh, algorithms and models that's, that filter out uh, such spam email. Another example is Google Translate. I mean, for those of us that have, have been working with Google Translate or any other translating systems, know how much better these systems have gotten over the past years with more and more adoption of complex large language models that have been trained on bigger and bigger data sets and they get increasingly better, right? Sentiment analysis, I have one example here. These are the kind of systems that can actually take, these are more used by customer facing um, operations and customer facing companies that basically review any sort of text information, any sort of feedback that is coming in and basically conduct some sort of analysis what the sentiment from these kind of texts is. This is a very typical application of natural language processing methods as well. The other is some sort of voice to speech and speech to voice recognition system, right? This is your Hey Siri, Hey Alexa, Hey Google. All of these actually work with natural language processing systems as well, but they obviously work at the interface between voice data or acoustic data as we call it and text data. And then of course, the most obvious one I leave for, for the very end, ChatGPT. Now this, this has really kind of transformed the way that we're actually working with natural language processing. We have basically, at least for myself, I consider it this way, I have a very intelligent intern <laughs> right next to me that I can ask a lot of questions. And this intern knows a lot of, more about a lot of things. Um, and I benefit from, from, from the system a lot. And I think this really is a very strong indicator uh, with regards to how strong AI systems are going to be in the future and how much we'll be able to benefit. Of course, this opens a lot of other questions and a lot of other fronts, but we, we stick to the topic for today. I see that there are no questions on the chat coming in, but please, if you have any questions, uh, especially for the virtual audience, please feel free to shoot them in the in the uh, in the in the chat, or please raise your hand and speak up. And same is the case, I would say, for the audience attending in person. If there's no questions, then I would like to start with the formalization of what natural language processing is. NLP. I will start using this acronym now. NLP is actually a what would you say, a multidisciplinary discipline in and, in and of its own self that lies at the intersection of methods and skills from computer science, from data science and AI, and also linguistics, right? So it's it's in really, in a sense, a multidisciplinary subdiscipline of AI, as it's called uh, already. And more specifically, natural language processing works with two main themes. One is natural language understanding, and the other is natural language generation. Let me see if I can start using a pointer. I hope that you can see the pointer as well. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Um, so with natural language understanding, the idea is to understand natural language and make it interpretable for computer systems and generation is then the obviously the, the reverse. And I'll go in that in just a minute, but from a pipeline perspective, natural language processing as a whole takes in what we call unstructured data in our domain, which is text data. It can also be in, in principle acoustic data or any other form of unstructured data, uses some sort of clever methods to convert such unstructured data in structured formats that are in principle then understandable by computer algorithms and computer systems, do some processing with it as per the need, and then of course convert it back to an unstructured format, which is then more natural in its nature so that human beings can actually understand them. 
This entire pipeline requires quite a few fundamental concepts and fundamental steps to be conducted. I have here on in this bubble right here listed some of them, and I will go in very brief in, in, in very briefly in what these concepts are in just a minute. But it's it's it for as a concept, it's quite intuitive. But of course, the, the magic lies in, in the detail and how these engines are actually actually set up. Another thing I would like to clarify uh, is what natural language processing is in relation to generative AI. I think we've been hearing the term generative AI a lot. Generative AI is a subfield of AI that works, as is suggested by the name, that works with generation of what I say, just content, right? So text, acoustic data, so speech, it can be music, for, for example, images, and then videos, which is just an aggregation of images all together. And so whilst not all generative AI is natural language processing and vice versa, it of course has an overlap, right? Because you can actually generate text through generative AI, uh, uh, methods, and this is where large language models actually sit right at the intersection these days, right? They're really generative AI tools uh, that can as assist us daily. So a formalization of this is also, in my opinion, quite important. Good. So then we move towards natural language understanding and natural language generation. And I will take just a few minutes uh, to formalize what this is. So natural language understanding uses what we call syntactic, so the syntax, and also the semantic analysis of text and speech. So semantic is then the meaning behind the text to determine what the meaning is of a sentence, right? So the syntax would be, here's an example, Alice is swimming and she is swimming against the current. The syntax would be that each word in the sentence, Alice swimming against the current, actually has a syntactical meaning, right? And then the semantic is the, the, the layer on top where each word, each word itself can also have a double meaning, which is then defined by the context around it, which is then denoted by the other sentence. The current version of the report is in the, 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 uh, the current version of the report is in the folder. And here the word current means something completely different than the word current in the above sentence, which is denoting something with a water body. And the way as human beings, you can think of it in a quite natural way, we read the sentence and we understand what the word current is denoting is by understanding the context around it. So language is all, all a lot more about con context, the surrounding context, than it is about the word itself, even though it is a fair bit about the word itself as well. So natural language understanding then explores these ideas, right? And more specifically, ex explores further subtasks that we very subconsciously do uh, when we're actually interpreting language, actually speaking language all the time. So when I say Alice is swimming and she is swimming against the current, I am doing tasks like part of speech tagging. I understand what swimming is, what Alice is. I'm doing that named entity recognition. I understand that there's an entity in there, which is Alice, for example. I'm doing word sense disambiguation, which is this example that I gave about the word current. Like how do I actually define what the word current is and what it means in principle in different contexts, right? That's the disambiguation part. And sentiment analysis, right? If I read a sentence, I have an intrinsic understanding of whether this is an anger, an emotion that is anger or happiness or, or sadness. We always implicitly are doing this. And this is something that computer systems that are oriented around natural language understanding are doing um, uh, when they're when they're trained to do so, of course. And natural language generation moving forward then is the process of producing human language in written or speech um, in, or speech speech responses based on some input data. So it is the the reverse, right? Um, so the examples of such a task would be summary generation, auto completion suggestions, things like that. And that is something that I must say. I, I, just to give you a fun fact, when I prepared these slide sets, I thought it was actually useful to mention these examples because I prepared this particular slide a year and a half ago. And now I think these kind of examples are quite obvious to a lot of us that have been using ChatGPT. So it really shows, shows to all of us how quickly systems move forward. Any questions so far? Okay, if that's not the case, again, once again, if you have questions, please shoot them in the chat. Um, then let's move a little bit to the more technical side of the presentation. And I promise uh, to try to make it as digestible and as easy to understand and perhaps even as intuitive to understand as possible uh, so that towards the end, you have a higher level of understanding of what we've been talking about overall anyway. So let's start with a basic premise. And the basic premise is that we as human beings, the way we understand language is not the way the computer systems actually work at their substrate level. They work with binaries, numbers, ones and zeros, right? And those ones and zeros can be encoded to actually represent 
bigger numbers as well, but at the end of the day, they're working with numbers, right? So human language means nothing. And the entire process of natural language processing involves somehow converting natural language into numbers that mean something to the computer, but more importantly, what they mean to the computer when translated back should mean something, the same thing to us. That's the key principle, right? And for that, a lot of processes come in. For example, there's this initial process of what we call tokenization. When you have to push in some, some text information to a machine, the first thing you need to do is break down this raw text into smaller chunks that can be then processed further, right? So one example here is a sentence, the cat sat on the mat. A typical example of the process of tokenization would be just breaking it down per word, right? So the cat sat on the mat. This is something that you can see, right? Then the next, another example of another process that you do after the process of tokenization is called limitization or stemming, right? Which is you normalize the text for their base base case or base root, right? And this is something that simplifies the language, what would you say, the language space that we have. Because I can have the word achievement, achieve, achieving, which are in principle three different words, but they point to the same semantic and that they point to the same concept, right? And you want to actually ensure that systems are, are as little loaded as possible in terms of the kind of parameters that they have to deal with. And this is the reason we conduct tasks like limitization and stemming. So likes can be skimmed down to like, better can be summarized all the way to, to good because it can denote something good and worse can be, can be limitized to, to bad, for example. So this is something that we this is something we use to reduce our our parameter space in some sense. And then once you have actually reduced your parameter space to to a good degree, so you you're still in the text space and you're not in the number space, you then have to now take your text space into a number space and this process is something that we call vectorization. So by a formal definition it is the process of encoding the stemmed or limitized tokens into numerics or vectors. This is where the real magic lies behind most of the natural language processing systems or algorithms, because you can use a, a huge variety of vectorization methods, and it all depends very much on what you want to do at the end, right? If you want to develop very, very generic, big, large language models that can chat with you, tell you jokes, do whatever, then of course, we move towards the kind of vectorization that we will talk about with ChatGPT, but there's other simpler methods as well that are fit for purpose. One very simple example, and I like using this as an example in, in broader, for, with broader audiences, is because it immediately turns the, the concept of uh, text to, to vectors, it, very, it makes it very intuitive. So have a look at this process of one-hot encodings or this method of one-hot encodings. Imagine you have a sentence, it's called, this is a cat, and you have identified four main limitized tokens from it. A cat is this, you have four, four text uh, parts, right? What you can do is you can take the number of words that you have, establish that many dimensions in your vector space per vector, right? So please try to, I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. And what you can do is you can assign a binary value for the word that that word in the vector represents. So in this case, you have 0001 for the word this. So the word this will be represented by a vector that is, it has the value 0001, right? And could, this could be infinitely long depending on how big your text space actually is, right? And you could do the same 0010 for is, 1000, so on and so forth, right? This is one way that you can actually represent language, right? There, nobody can say you can't represent language like this, but of course, it, it, had, it brings forth a ton of challenges in its, in its own self. One challenge being, for example, A, the vectors are very sparse, so you're actually holding a lot of information in these vectors sorry, a lot of data in these vectors without holding a lot of information, right? That's one problem. The second problem is, as I mentioned, language has a lot to do with word ordering and also the context, right? The context in which, so what order does the word come in? And also around what other words does that word come in, right? And these two principles are actually lost when you actually try to encode language in this particular way, right? But still, for some purposes, it actually works quite well. For example, if you want to do text classification or sentiment analyses, because if you have certain words that you're looking for and they're actually found in your vector space, then cool, you can have a fair, fair understanding that this um, uh, this text denotes this emotion, for example. We have an, uh, another way of vectorize, vectorization, which is called bag of words. Um, this is in principle an extension of uh, one-hot encodings. Um, so I will not go into too much detail there, but in principle, it 
instead of using um, just one vector for, per word, what it does is it can actually establish a vector per sentence, right? So you can have a vector space from all the vocabulary words that you have in your space. And then if a sentence, the red dog has three of the words, then it will assign uh, the, the vector value one, 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 zero, zero, zero. So it actually carries more information per sentence. So that's just another way of, of conducting vectorization, again, based on need. But these are not the vectorization methods that we're working with these days when we're talking about really, really complicated large language models like ChatGPT and so forth. They're, they're much more complicated. And one intermediate, more complicated vectorization method uh, is called Word2Vec here. Uh, Word2Vec basically is a neural network or shallow neural network uh, based uh, architecture. Um, what it does is in principle, it also creates vectors per word. But the vector information, the vector contains information not just about the word, but rather around the, su the surrounding text, right? Or the preceding text or the proceeding text. So you have this image right here. What Word2Vec can do is for the word bank, it can take what we call the preceding words as context, right? We went to the river and it will actually assign some sort of vector value based on the words that precede it. Or what it can do is that it can take the word bank in another sentence and use the preceding parts of the sentence as context, right? That's what it can do. And this is more clever than just a simple um, one-hot encoding or bag of words methods, because again, it's now starting to look into the context, right? Which is something that we determined is very, very important for us to understand human language. Still, word to vec as a vectorization method has its challenges because it works, I've written that here somewhere. The architectures in word to vec um, uh, uh, the models in word to vec architectures are unidirectional, meaning they interpret language sequentially. So it will read, we went to the river bank, and it will only read the word bank after it's read the word river. And if you actually think about the way we understand language, we actually don't necessarily only understand language by reading language sequentially or interpreting language sequentially, but rather I will read something and then it will make semi sense to me. And when I read the full sentence is when I'll say, oh, now it makes sense to me or rather, oh, I was I misunderstood what it was supposed to mean. It now means this. So we can trace back what we actually understand from a sentence based on information that actually sits afterwards as well. So the surrounding context. Right. And this is where word to vec as a vectorization method does not work very well. And the other thing is word to vec also generates the same vector per word. Right. And that's something that we don't necessarily do intrinsically in our own heads, if you think about it, because based on different contexts, we understand the word current, as I gave in the previous example, quite differently, right? So we, we have some sort of delineation in our heads, and that's something we try to replicate with models as well. So I've criticized a lot of the models, and I've done that for a reason, because I would like to then talk about models that are a little bit better. And this is where principles behind the large language models like ChatGPT come in. And it's, it's, it's super cool what we can actually do now with state-of-the-art uh, models that exist. Before I go there, I would like to just quickly review some fundamental concepts in machine learning, even though these have been touched upon uh, in the previous force webinars. Um, I think it's still useful to really quick touch upon them. Uh, because it builds on uh, on the rest of the, the the today's talk as well. So in machine learning, we have three main ways of learning, or an algorithm has three main ways of learning, and this is obviously once again need based. The first is supervised learning, and it says ninety five percent of cases are of supervised nature. And what supervised learning in principle is is that you take a model, you initially train it by showing it data plus showing it this expected outcome or the target variable as to what the model should actually infer from the data in relation to the target variable. And then you start, once you have, you've shown the model enough and you expect the model to be trained on this, then you start actually testing and validating to your, your model by checking if the model starts predicting the things on unseen data the way it's supposed to be. Quick summary of what supervised learning is. Unsupervised learning is unsupervised, meaning you show your model data with no target variable, so to say, and you ask the model to identify patterns in the data for different features, right? So here I have this example of cars or child playing with cars. And if you were to give uh, a model that is unsupervised in its in its nature, you, you would give it characteristics of many, many cars. Uh, I don't know, um, like a, the, the, the brand, the color, the type, whatever, and you would ask the model or the model will automatically then basically cluster or classify data based on different features. That's what unsupervised learning is, and it's useful. 
because it can actually sometimes provide you insights about patterns in your data that you might not have actually thought of yourself. So that's where unsupervised learning becomes quite useful. And then reinforcement learning is, is an interesting one because it has really lied at the very basis of very, very complex um, uh, learning patterns in very advanced algorithms. Reinforcement learning works in this in the following ways. You have a model, you expect the model to actually predict some sort of an outcome, and the model comes with some sort of an outcome, and you have some reward system. You tell the model, yep, it's done the right thing, and the model tries to trace back as to what it did to come to this outcome, right? And it tries to further cement or further, um, what would you say, strengthen the, 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 the rationale, so to say, or in, in mathematical terms, the weights and so on and so forth that it's been doing to get to that outcome. Or alternatively, it'll come out with, a, with an outcome to you, and then you will say, nope, wrong. And it'll try to actually go back and try to adjust parameters in its system to understand why it went wrong and where it went wrong, and it'll try to go again. And it keeps on doing that. These kind of models keep on doing that until um, like they get really, really good at the task that they're doing, right? And this is in principle, this lies behind, and this kind of principle lies behind the more complicated models that have uh, won at the games of Go. That, Go is now better played by an AI system than, than, than the most masterful human being. Same is the case with chess, so on and so forth. And they use reinforcement learning. So that was a quick summary of what supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning is. And I will touch back on what the why these all three all, all three of these concepts are important when it comes to ChatGPT. So ChatGPT, I asked ChatGPT what ChatGPT is by its own self in order to tell me what it is, right? And it highlights a couple of things that were of interest to me. It says, I'm an AI language model that, that is designed to understand and generate human-like text. And I find it quite good that it says human-like as opposed to just human-natured or human text or whatever. And then it generates responses, answers questions, provide explanations, engage in conversations, so on and so forth, and performs various language-related tasks. And what it uses are deep learning techniques, what it calls specifically transformer, transformer neural networks, to conduct a quote unquote predictive approach where it predicts the next word or phrase given the context of the previous text it has received. And that's quite cool, right? So for the remaining part of at least the technical side of this presentation, I would like to focus on these three things. I would like to focus on how does a large language model numerically represent language? We've already touched on the process of vectorization, but how does a model like ChatGPT do it with reference to what we call this transformer architecture? Then more importantly, how does the model learn this representation? Like what's the process of, of doing it from a training standpoint, right? And there's a three-step approach built into this. This three-step approach actually uses the supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning principles. And then how does the model actually generate a response based on what it has learned? That's the process of predictive modeling, right? And we'll touch on that in just a minute. So. The numerical representation of language, its this is what is referred to when we call, use the word embeddings. You will hear the word embeddings a lot when you talk to people uh, that are natural language processing or LLM geeks, right? Embeddings. Uh, and that's basically what it is. It sounds cooler than it is. Well, it is quite cool, actually. Um, and the state of the art embeddings are these days fundamentally based on the transformer architecture. I would would have liked to go into a bit, deep, bit of detail of what these transformer architectures are, but for the sake of uh, simplicity and also fit for purposeness, we will leave the, the technical side, but I would like to, from a con conceptual standpoint, show what it actually does. So transformer architectures do what word to vec I said couldn't do, which is A, they're bi-directional in nature. They can actually look at target words by looking at the surrounding context in both directions, right? And they can actually identify differences in context and hence can have they have a better sense of disambiguation for words than perhaps other other uh, other models that existed before and they by by doing so they create this embedding space where they have a vector associated with each different word and you have an example embedding space here where you have words like sun red happy sad love horse dog cat sun human guitar violin and viola right and you will see that words like happy they're clustered closer together to words like sad and love because it's some, something to do with emotions. Um, and, and love is, is clustered together with happy as well. And then you see sun and red are a bit closer because the sun can be characterized to be red or orange, depends on how you see it. <laughs> and then horse, dog, cat, or animals, so on and so forth, right? 
And the reason they're clustered together is because when you actually look at them in the vector space, the numbers denote that these vectors are rather close to each other, right? So this is a two-dimensional mapping of what is typically a very, very, very high dimensional mapping. That's principally what it is. And what is then what, what it can help you do, and this is basically a repetition of the previous example, is you when you use sentence like I love ice cream versus how is your day love, right? In this, in this case, the word love denotes different things. One is an affection towards ice cream, or you like ice cream, I guess. And then the other thing is referring to a person, right? And the same is the case with the website server is down, right? Versus server, can you please get the order? I find that example, I don't know, quite funny. Um, and in both cases, the words mean something different and transformer based architectures can actually make a much better distinction um, in terms of word sense disambiguation, syntactic understanding, as well as semantic understanding. Um, something that I found uh, quite cool is you can, if, if you would like, I can share this link with you afterwards. You can actually play around with these kind of models, right? Uh, even with word to vec this is actually possible, where if you actually input words like king and you say subtract the word man, so the vector representations, now we're not talking about the text, but you input the word king and you subtract the word man and then in, input also sum the word woman, then the vector representation that'll come out from such models is going to be closely corresponding to the word queen, right? So this shows you that these models in their vector representations somehow pick up this understanding, right? That if I say, hey, king is to man as, as woman is to, and then the model can actually tell you queen, right? And it can do so by, by mathematical operations, which is super cool. It's super cool. Cool. So that's what embeddings are. So this, this answered the first question of, how does the model actually represent language, right? So that's the how question. Um, so that's the embedding. And then how does it actually enter this embedding space? How does it actually develop this embedding space? This is where you start using these, these principles that I talked about. So the first principle is unsupervised learning. That's corresponding to step one of training of these models. And it more specifically uses this technique called masked language modeling, right? How does it actually work? So imagine at the outset, you take a model and you give it a text like this. Ice bears, also known as polar bears, are the largest species of bear on Earth, so on and so forth. You don't necessarily need to read the whole sentence. What the model will then do is it will mask it. That's why it's called mass language modeling. It'll mask some parts of the sentence, right? And in principle, the model has, it has available to it to its own self what these words are supposed to be, but it will in its training part just remove these words and it'll just say mask or something like that, some placeholder term. And what the model will do is it'll look at all the words, it will create some sort of embedding for it, and it'll, it'll instantiate embeddings, and based on that, it will try to predict what lies behind this masking, right? That's, that's the process. And this is where I can already go into the next slide. When you have an initial masking, it might, it might say ice bears also known as, and it will initially from its instantiated um, uh, embeddings might predict white rabbit, right? It might predict that. But the model also knows what the actual value is supposed to be, the actual word is supposed to be behind the mask, right? And it will then, it's basically like closing your eyes. It'll check the answer once again and say, ah, damn it, like that's not what I wanted to actually see, right? And it'll upgrade its, waste, uh, its weights in, in this architecture, in this neural network architecture, and it will feed the difference in, in, in error back to the model, right? It'll, it'll update the, the weights and it'll feed it back, so on and so forth, until when it sees such semantics coming in, such text coming in, it actually starts predicting polar bears. So it then understands then when you have the context ice bears, right, or ice or something like that, then it's typically referring to polar bears as opposed to white rabbit, because you probably wouldn't find white rabbit. And the reason it knows that is because it will be given a ton of text where white rabbit will always be found and found surrounding other words, right? But polar bears will be found closer to terms like ice or North Pole or things like that. So it understands this context. So this is how a model, a model is created, which is what we call a foundation model. It starts creating some representations um, for, for language, right? For vocabulary. But what these kind of foundation models are useful for, what they're useful for is that they can do these auto completion tasks, these next word predictions, right? So you can actually provide prompts to these foundation models and you say, write a short poem about a wise frog. And the GPT-3 initially, this is an example from GPT-3, what it would do is it will spit out a couple of 
completion requests. It will spit out a couple of responses. It'll say, write a short story in which your character has two different names. Write a short story in which you try to get something back that you have lost, so on and so forth. It will it is kind of proceeding onwards with your prompt, but that's not what you're doing. As a human being, you understand that this is a request. It's a prompt, right? And it should respond back. And then this is where then the supervised learning comes in, where some trained machine learning engineers, experts will start training this model using the embedding space that it has to tell it which kind of responses it should give, how its responses should actually be structured, right? And then once you train it long enough, this is what ChatGPT is. It's actually been trained for chatting, and hence it's called ChatGPT, right? Then it will start giving responses like, a frog is a symbol of wisdom. He knows all the secrets of the world, so on and so forth. It'll actually then write you a poem, which is quite cool. At the same time, the first versions as all of us that develop something know that it's 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 never good enough, and you obviously need reiterative and 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 further re reiterative uh, fine tuning of whatever tools that you're developing. This is where then this reinforcement learning steps come in, um, and this is specifically called RL RLHF reinforcement learning through human feedback. Right, so this is the further uh, fine tuning part, and this is actually cool. One of the reasons, or perhaps even a, a major reason for why OpenAI actually released ChatGPT in November last year, yes, you might think that they're doing it out of a very generous uh, will to, to help the world. That is, in principle, I guess, also what they're trying to do. But more importantly, they're trying to put the product out to the market, and they want to see how the product is performing in real-life examples, how this product would be used by the normal user. And then they are using the feedback that us human beings can give it, like with, in this example, with the thumbs up, thumbs down, some comments on what, what's wrong with this, to then iteratively actually update the model the way in the direction that it needs to be. So one example that I have here, I asked is to tell me a dad joke. It says, sure, here's a dad joke for you. Did you hear about the restaurant on the moon? Great food, but no atmosphere, right? I would have given it a big thumbs up. That's a very good joke, <laughs> right? So that's that's the that's the process of reinforcement learning through human feedback. So when you have now I put it in quotes a final product because it's never really a final a product, then you obviously have a model, a tool that can actually start giving you some responses, and then it's working on what the what on the principle of next token prediction. So when you ask ChatGPT some sort of query, right, it's it's been trained to respond in a chat-based way, but what it's doing is it's actually, in principle, it's not thinking. It does not have a sense. It does not have emotions per se. What it's doing is it's generating one word after the other, and it's been trained to understand which word should appear after the, the other based on probabilistic distributions, right? So one example here is it will start spitting out, today I feel very, and then it will at each step have some sort of probabilistic distribution sitting in front of it, where probabilities to the words that are emotion related, like happy, sad, will be rather higher, right? Then school, today I feel very school, will perhaps doesn't make any sense, and the probabilistic distribution will be a bit lower. And Bjork, I don't even know what that means, would be perhaps quite low, right? So this is just to denote that each step of next token prediction, you're actually having a prediction, a probabilistic prediction at each step, right? And this is how ChatGPT actually generates all these responses, right? I find that to be quite, quite, quite cool to know uh, on a more mechanistic level. I think we're still good on time. I believe I will just take two minutes uh, to talk about how this is not just in in theory something that we're interested in, especially in our industry, in in my company, in our company, which is Aldea, but rather these are principles and tools that we're actually using as well. Um, so something that we've been able to do ever since OpenAI actually made APIs available for us to be able to use the models um, from a back-end development standpoint is that we actually started developing Q&A systems, also summarization systems, uh, to enable our subject matter experts to be able to ask questions from, about the documents to this chatbot so that it actually responds, rely, responds with reliable and also good answers um, uh, such that a user does not have to actually go through these documents themselves, but rather uh, they just get an answer straight off the bat, right? So here's one example. You can ask something about a well. You say, do you have any information about well 25 to 15? For example, you want to just get a kickstart uh, about, about the information, and you can specify, give me an answer in three sentences, and the, the tool actually performs can perform quite significant significantly well, and it can say, yes, I have information. Sure, it is located in XYZ place. It has hydrocarbon potential in this reservoir. And this was plugged and abandoned as a dry well, and the total depth was X, Y, Z. So because you didn't provide more specification as to what information you wanted, it gave you the more obvious information, but you can get 
excuse me, more and more specific and it can perform better and better in terms of the quality of responses you're looking to get. So this is where then prompt, prompt engineering also becomes a skill if you're going to be interacting with such, such tools. But I will leave it at that and we'll hand over to Lucas if you would like yeah. to take over. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Mahat, for this really uh, great uh, introduction to NLP and large language models. And now from my side and Akabibi's side, I would like to introduce uh, sort of our journey of how we've gone about introducing these large language models, specifically ChatGPT in our organization and how we see this uh, specifically applied in the exploration uh, context with one of our examples. I do want to highlight that this has been a really uh, big initiative uh, that has been cross-functional, cross-organizational, uh, all throughout RKVP digital and also the uh, exploration side. And I'm just uh, have the benefit to be able to uh, represent sort of this great work uh, that we've been doing there uh, today. So we've all been pretty much exposed to ChatGPT. Um, ChatGPT was introduced in November last year, and I would say, yes, it's been sort of the uh, fastest growing application I think that's ever been created uh, before Instagram and uh, WhatsApp and, and all of these uh, digital technologies available to all of us today. Um, but it's been sort of uh, lingering a little bit more in the workplace. We started to see uh, many more people using ChatGPT for their own day-to-day -day work um, sort of in March, April, around that time. And that also prompted us to say, OK, we should really look into how we can uh, make use of this, how we can see if this is an innovation we need to be a part of and how we can best make use of uh, these uh, technologies. So the way that we approached this was uh, we partnered with uh, Microsoft around uh, their collaboration with OpenAI. And what we wanted to achieve here is that uh, we wanted to be able to provide uh, the use of large language models specifically uh, systems like ChatGPT for our um, for our colleagues in the organization so that they can, can continue working with these tools because we believe that they are um, incredibly important and can really increase the efficiency uh, of uh, individuals and of teams. So we, we partnered with Microsoft. We started to deploy uh, these APIs. And then what we also, in addition, uh, did was to think about how we can make these tools available to, to the end users. And of course, having a programmatic API is maybe uh, not something that everybody is uh, comfortable with. Uh, writing code to interface with ChatGPT is not sort of the way that most people expect uh, to use these tools, but rather to have an application where you can uh, actually interface with these language models, where you can store your conversations where you can have iterations where you can come back and and see sort of what you've done previously and i think that's a really unique feature of chat gpt as well as a tool itself that you actually interface with such a language model in this kind of iterative conversational uh, manner so we started to build an application internally which we call chat which essentially tries to provide this kind of uh, service that uh, or this experience that ChatGPT is providing also to our uh, internal uh, colleagues. So it's a very uh, simple interface. Uh, you can essentially ask you questions just as you expect on, on ChatGPT uh, itself. But the important difference here is that this is now enabled in a cyber secure uh, manner, which means that people who have access to certain documentation can actually use it in their workplace and that they can be sure that the data that we actually feed into these systems does not leave uh, our tenants and our uh, systems. Now, of course, uh, this whole journey has been more than just creating an application and, and putting an interface uh, on top of the API. Uh, the organization also had to go through some maturation process around uh, governance and learning about things like responsible use of AI systems. And it's, it has been really uh, valuable to partner with uh, Microsoft around these topics and, and also get their input uh, throughout uh, this journey. Now, one of the key things that I want to highlight, and that sort of goes a little bit beyond uh, just the standard use of ChatGPT, but uh, also ties in with what Mahat was presenting before, is how we can actually enhance these conversational systems with additional knowledge that they were not trained on specifically potentially information that is proprietary to individual organizations or individual uh, users. 
And there is a whole spectrum of ways that you can think about these language models as they exist today. Um, there's a specific concept which we call retrieval augmented language models, which essentially says we're going to retrieve information that is relevant to a question or a query or a task that we have at hand. And we're going to supplement these language models with that additional information so that they can fulfill uh, their purpose. If you think about search engines, they essentially do a lookup, uh, also using language models potentially, but they try to produce uh, facts and, and references that you can actually go to the different websites. Uh, there's things like keyword search, which only takes into account individual keywords and not the semantic meaning um, that Mahat uh, explained just previously. But we could also use just a language model like ChatGPT itself with no additional information. And then we have to rely on sort of what the language model has been um, has been actually trained. And that knowledge might be very limited and it might also be false. So it's these two things sort of exist on a spectrum. And then in the middle of this, uh, if I may use the pointer here, you have these retrieval augmented systems where you actually combine things like ChatGPT with a search engine or with a database of documents uh, that you that you think are going to contain relevant information. And this is what we um, actually consider one of our use cases um, in, in RKBP, specifically around the expiration uh, setting, where actually expiration is a very creative process where you need to take into account many different sources of information. And in our case, this could mean that we're trying to scour through maybe 50 or more years of uh, documentation and history around uh, expiration in Norway and also beyond. And we've created this system called the Exploration Robot Chat, where we're trying to aim to introduce these proprietary documentation and general scientific knowledge into a conversational system like ChatGPT. And these kinds of documents can, of course, include our own APA applications. They can uh, be post-well analysis. They can be relinquishment reports from the MPD, uh, but also scientific papers that we find are relevant. And ultimately, this can be used to find sort of the golden nuggets that uh, we're hoping to find across these different historical documents for our current exploration work, sometimes contrarian views around what uh, do we actually uh, think is, is going on uh, in, in a certain area. And this, of course, can help us to potentially accelerate the work that explorationists are doing, but also increase the quality since we're able to touch on much more information than only the a keyword based search. And from a technical point of view, Mahad explained uh, there are these so called embeddings. Uh, th these embeddings uh, actually capture the semantic content within parts of, uh, of or within sections of text. Um, and what we do here is we actually take all of these uh, documents that we that we've identified are relevant for our exploration users. We split them up into chunks, paragraphs, sentences and we embed those into these semantic uh, vector spaces. So you can think of this as similar paragraphs or paragraphs that contain similar information should be closed in this vector space. And if I go in with a question about a certain topic, then I can find the nearest neighbors of those, um, of those uh, vectors, which are actually parts of these documents that we have in our corpus. Um, so the end user actually interfaces with an application that is very similar to this. But every time the user asks a question, we go in and find these relevant pieces of, uh, of text. We provide that as contextual information for chat GPT and then say, please create an answer according to this contextual information um, to the question that the user has actually asked. So again, this is a very simple interface that actually builds up on the previous work that we've done. But one of the important things here as you can see also is that when a user actually asks a question, that there are also sources of the um, documents being provided to the end user. And one of the reasons why, and this is something that I just want to highlight here uh, using one of the examples. So in this case, for example, I asked what is the best prospect on the Norwegian continental shelf? A very broad question for which it actually does not have a very clear answer. <laughs> but it, it does highlight that there are some prospects which have a high potential. I, I did do a little bit of redacting just to make sure that uh, we don't have uh, these numbers uh, out in the open. But um, 
there are certain prospects that are potentially interesting, and you can see also based on the sources that it covers a quite broad range of, of documents. It doesn't just go into one document. And the important thing here is that actually these language models, they can produce absolute nonsense. So if you've used uh, uh, LLMs before, ChatGPT, and you ask uh, things like, um, what is the fastest time to cross the English Channel by foot? It will provide a random person's name, and it will say it took six hours or something like that, and it just makes stuff up. If you ask it if it's possible to cross the Eng English Channel by foot, it will say, oh, of course not. Uh, this isn't possible because there's an ocean, so you actually have to swim. So having this kind of uh, contextual information and being able to validate immediately where this information is coming from is incredibly important to counteract these, uh, this notion of hallucinations when these models uh, make stuff up, which is not uh, actually factual. So you can't think of these systems really as search engines on their own, but they can provide an interface to information that might be relevant. So in this case, it's quite nice because you can then uh, dive into the, these examples further and you can follow up with questions that take into account all of the information that was there before. So in this case, I asked about one specific prospect that it had mentioned here and why this is considered a good prospect. And you can see now that the sources are much more focused around one specific uh, block where this prospect is likely located. And it comes back with a couple information on uh, why the probability of success might be low or why it's high, what the sort of uh, uh, structure is. And, and all of this could potentially be uh, very interesting to an explorationist and relevant. And you can then follow up again and sort of say, OK, but what type of structure is it? And it will go back and search uh, the documents again. So you can have this conversational uh, body or colleague that you can uh, actually uh, have a conversation over these broad range of documents. So I just want to finish with uh, sharing a little bit around um, what we learned from all of this experience up to now. Maybe not so much around the technical side of, of creating these application, but sort of organizationally as well. I think it's impor incredibly important to go through this process of establishing some governance around how you deal with these models. They introduce a very new piece of technology that, quite frankly, we still don't understand how they actually work in principle. Um, so having things like governance on who gets access, what data is being shared, uh, is incredibly important. From an organizational perspective, it's also critical to understand where do you actually stand uh, regarding these technologies, especially regarding data. Uh, the foundational data work that needs to be done is incredibly important to actually be able to supplement the information into these systems. If you have good repositories of documents that you can easily interface with, you'll have a much easier time to actually build up these systems in the future. While if you have a lot of uh, sort of work or groundwork to do around data governance or document management, then that might be a much longer journey uh, for you. And then, of course, one of the things is that this field is incredibly fast in its uh, evolution. And if you follow sort of uh, researchers or practitioners all over the world, um, there is constantly something happening and new stuff being developed. But at the same time, uh, at least we in Akabibi, we sort of follow the philosophy that we actually want to continue building the competency in-house, that we understand what do we actually need in terms of these applications, where should we focus our efforts, where do we actually have the value around this. And that means that we also need to engage in building out these systems ourselves and building that uh, know-how on an individual uh, basis. Right, so that, I think Mahat and I uh, thank you for the uh, participation in today's uh, session and we're happy to take um, any questions that you might have. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much Thank for you. a great talk. So uh, yeah, it's great to see how quickly you guys implemented that in the company. So I guess there's quite a few jealous companies out there. It's good to see. Um, Henry, you had a, had a question here. You wanted to know which model has been used for the WellX. So I guess that's the embeddings model you would be interested in. Yeah. I think uh, I can quickly take that question. So to actually create the embeddings, I think we, if I'm not, I have to remember because we tried out different versions. It's either Ada or Curie. That's for the embeddings. And then for the completion requests, 
uh, then we use the GPT 3.5 Turbo. Um, once again, these are more fluid systems right now where we obviously are always trying to optimize how these systems are actually set up. Uh, and then every week or so, we're actually optimizing them uh, to see if they can perform any any better. And with your second part of your question, which adaptation have you put into place? So of course, we want to make sure that these systems provide factually as much correct information as possible to limit hallucinations. We will play around with certain parameters regarding temperatures of these models, of course, and also we ensure that we make best cheap best use of prompt engineering uh, uh, practices to, to ensure that when we actually send out this context query, we also send out what we call this boundary condition, query boundary condition to ensure that the model knows that it should only provide information or answers from the context that it has provided. And more often than not, we don't want it to use its foundational knowledge, so to say, right? Because its foundational knowledge could be it could be hallucinating or it could be in contradiction to some, something, some, something that we're placing for it as a context. Okay, thank you. Then we have a question here from Jaap. Um, Jaap's asking how how we how he can get more specific information out of ChatGPT, say for example the SEG or the EAG web page. Unfortunately, Jaap, that's not so easy as it sounds because these models were trained two three years ago. So you have to use a system really like Lucas or like uh, Fabric from Jesse Lord is doing, whereby you you retrieve information. From these websites and then use ChatGPT to take that information that you retrieve from these websites and turn them into text. Um, is there anything else that we have here? Hey guys, just for those who are still online, if you're now interested, join the hackathon. I think you're going to learn a ton and it's always been good fun before, sort of. I think, um, are there any questions here in the audience? I see George has one. Oh, Last nice person referencing. Have you experienced that citations? Yes. Have you experienced that citations are hallucinated often, right? If you ask ChatGPT, uh, not on the internal data, I guess, I, I, Lucas, you may want to answer the question. Yeah, there are ways to circumvent that. I mean, you can do, you can do what's called prompt engineering, but you can also, if you if you have a vector database like this, or if you have a database of retrieved chunks, you know exactly which chunks are sort of uh, actually being used in the retrieval of the information. So you can supplement uh, the list of documents. I have a bit of a follow up on that yeah. uh, with regards to the documents. One thing that we've seen is uh, language. So mm -hmm. the language of the documents matters. You ask a question in Norwegian, we see that we get Norwegian answers and Norwegian sources, uh, and vice mm -hmm. versa. Is is this something that you dealt with with Arco Pepe's solution? You can fix it in the prompt. <laughs> yeah, I would say. It's not something that we've encountered yet, mm -hmm. uh, but I would expect that we might actually encounter this as well. I would also say that maybe you need an intermediate layer to say the database of documents. Mm -hmm. Maybe you have to do some pre-processing to translate those documents, or you have to do some prompt engineering to say, I want my answers always in English. Mm -hmm. Or if you find them in Norwegian, uh, uh, first translate them and then use them in yeah. the context. Uh, so there are ways to, I think, get around this, but it does add some complexity if you have uh, other languages. Um, maybe one comment on the one for um, Jaap uh, Mont. If you want to, if you want to use uh, ChatGPT with search engines, there is a, there's the paid version which has that functionality back again. So you can you can then actually use that as well if it's sure. not in an enterprise setting. Um, okay, excellent. I haven't seen that. Um, is there any methods to train a model to understand equations? First, simply understand equations with variable simple or in the simplest form would be some model to understand. I, I guess I'm not entirely sure. I guess it depends. You know, there's there are, there are plenty of models out there now, especially in the open source space that are specifically trained on tasks like mathematics or coding and stuff like that. So I would recommend just have a look around on Hagen face uh, and look for the models that have recently been most downloaded. Uh, I guess that's always a good prompt. Yeah, there's also yeah. Uh, uh, one from Hagen. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, Wolfram Alpha plugin for ChatGPT is a good one here. Yeah. Yeah, just a, a comment there would be that, I mean, I'm not aware of uh, any models. Uh, I'm not fully aware of any of these models uh, 
that are designed or, or fine-tuned for mathematical operations. But I think it's always very, very important to understand how these models are principally set up. Once again, they're they're working on probabilistic distributions, so they're answering questions based on what they've seen before, not because they're actually physically calculating them before, right? And that's something that I experienced in the earlier stages of the release of ChatGPT as well, where I, I even sent a screenshot to Kai right here, where I said, can you please add 81 plus 19? And it would say 100, right? Yeah. And I would say, no, it's 110. Uh, I, and then it'd say, oh, excuse me, sorry, that's, that's my mistake. And then I would say, what's 81 plus 19? And it would say 110. So of course, it's using this reinforcement learning, but can also be tricked. This was, of course, the earlier phases of ChatGPT when it was released. I think they've added a bit more robustness to the, to the tools because uh, they're also doing a very good job. But in principle, it's important to understand what these models are and what they're not. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. So my question would be to you, Lucas, uh, and would be around, uh, have you tried to fine tune a model based on your documents? And if so what techniques were you using to fine tune it? The answer is no. Okay. <laughs> and I'll give you a reason, at least uh, two yeah. reasons why. One is um, actually creating a, a data set for fine tuning is quite uh, difficult to do. It requires you to have some domain knowledge, SME time potentially to actually create such a good data set for fine tuning. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the question of how, how if we had a, a fine tuned model, how would we actually be able to, to sort of validate that? Mm -hmm. um, again, you need a data set somehow to be able to sort of measure the performance, whether the fine-tuned model is actually doing something better than we had before. Um, there are other ways of trying to get around this problem as well, like mm -hmm. retrieval augmented uh, or in-context learning. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what we focused on now, but we're also for the sake of trying to measure how good our retrieval augmented systems are, we will also need to go through the process of trying to quantify that. So at some point we might actually need to create such a data set, mm -hmm. but then it has to be sort of tailored to the task at hand. So loss evaluation and data collection would be the biggest problem. Yeah, I mean. there is no standard data set for this in uh, oil and gas, I would say, maybe in some parts. And then that's the that's why we're running the hackathon and we're actually paying for a large data set now yeah. to make that large data set and then how we will use that in the downstream tasks of you know checking the validity and the improvements of it but that's data set that we have in oil and gas is still far too small to train any large language model the only thing you can achieve is to fine tune the embeddings model right that puts the sentences in the vector if you get there then we're already a large step ahead but using the power of chat gpt which is able to communicate with you and using the data set to basically teaching chat gpt that this is more information you have now no not like that you use the embeddings model to say an oil show is something different than a theater show Mm -hmm. And then you go like, okay, when I when somebody asked for an oil show, it goes into the embeddings model. The embeddings model looks in your huge document corpus, what is very close in vector space to oil show. It will then find fluorescence. And then it hands that snippet of fluorescence and oil show to, to ChatGPT and say, ChatGPT, make a nice sentence out of that so a human can understand that. If you currently do that, it most likely, if you ask for show, it finds some theater, some performances, what have you not, right? Because there is in that in vector space, show and theater show is much closer together than show and fluorescence. So that's what we're trying to do with the hackathon is just to see if we can actually have a better embeddings model. Or at least we're providing the data and then maybe somebody can make a better embeddings model. That's the challenge for me. Maybe one more thing to add there is that um, you need to also think about why you are actually fine-tuning. Like adding more knowledge to the language model is maybe also going to make other things worse, right? So if you if you want to combine the, the power of what all of the chat GPT system has been trained on, plus now your data means that you're going to potentially lose some fidelity on other stuff that chat GPT was able to do before, but which may very well be relevant for interfacing with the system. To make it domain specific, so consider chat GPT with there are multiple GPTs, yeah. generated predictive text for sure. domain specific. Yeah. So that was my whole idea of right. fine tuning it. Yeah. Then you already have a good idea about what you want to achieve. Um, 
So I guess you just need a, a good enough. data set. Yeah, yes. uh, there was a <laughs> there was a recent publication that came from Young or something like that, where they did something for yeah. geosciences, mm -hmm. this big yeah. paper. Um, do you have any more questions we missed here? There was one that came that just went after the child. Right. It's interesting. So that's business case around work. How do you justify this piece of work? KPI metrics that yeah. can potentially be. And it's always hard, but you know, it's sort of it's sort of a little bit like when Google came into the business, somebody asking you how do you justify the value of this? People are spending time Googling around. Um, I, that's maybe my very blunt view of that. Uh, I think we need I, a data set. I again. mean, it, bigger information. Hands up here who is not drowned in unstructured data. <laughs> and so if you find somebody, some tool that helps you make sense of unstructured data quicker than you can, it's, then you have created value. That's how simple I see the world. Yeah, in principle, it's not been about like at least at the at the at the stage that we're at. I think for all the companies, in principle, the explicit or ex exquisite numbers, sorry, they don't matter, right? The idea is can we speed up processes from at least a qualitative perspective as well? And I think it's worth pursuing yeah. um, within Winter Saldea. We do try to make a business case because we already had a BERT based um, tool, which we called Exploration Advisory Tool, that actually. The, the the product owners there did put in some effort to understand what the value generator potential it is and it's quite significant right I don't know the numbers off the top of my head but it's 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 not something that that should surprise anyone if you can save a lot of time you multiply that with the amount of money you're spending per hour working it saves the company a lot of time if you can just get the answers in two minutes as opposed to two days trying yeah. to get the documents manually yeah. okay. One question for uh, ECVP, like how, how do you build the in-house competencies? I mean, are you using uh, the old fire reservoir engineers and geoscientists, scientists or who's, who's, yeah, who's needed to make this happen? Well, it's a, it's a mixture of, of people. I mean, there's on the one hand, let's say using chat GPT and, and using it well is something that you could consider a skill that you can train many people on just for their day-to-day -day work, like uh, how can I summarize a document? How should I formulate my prompts to, to these systems? What can these systems do and what can they not do? Like uh, when we created this chat RKBP system, one of the things we did was we had a small user group in the beginning and we asked them to pro provide feedback on things that they thought were surprising or things that they expected to work. And many of the things that people thought would be possible are technically not feasible, like expecting information to be there that is actually not even hooked up to the system because they maybe think of this as a as a search engine. So you have to actually start um, sort of increasing that know-how around what are the capabilities of these tools, what are they connected with, what are they not, um, how do you provide good inputs. Then if you go to a more technical level, of course, um, you have to have data scientists or developers that understand these systems and how they can be used, the right tools and libraries that are maybe relevant. Um, but then also you need direct exposure to your customer or your sort of people that are going to use these tools and to understand their problems, because not everything, uh, not everything is able to be solved using this technology, but there are some problems that might very well be solved using these kinds of tools which you can then try to tailor to those specific use cases. For that, though, you also have to increase sort of the knowledge and understanding of your sort of target user group a little bit around what is the potential of the technology, um, what is possible today, what might be possible in the future, what is surely not going to happen. Um, and that's, uh, I think, important. I don't know if that gives you some idea around this. I th yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good, good having lots of questions. The presentation will be available online on YouTube afterwards. The, the, the PowerPoint, I guess, as well in this case, that makes no difference. So enjoy it. Uh, we'll send around the link to all the participants on YouTube, share that around with other people. The sharing is caring. And uh, see you next time around and hopefully see a couple of you for the hackathon. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much. Bye.